Welcome everybody, this is Steve coming to you with another Writing Musings. This is number seven. I uh, wanted to answer a few questions that were thrown at me uh, and also uh, cover some new things that I think would be useful to you guys. Uh, item one, why do you struggle with remembering things? Remember what? Uh, oh, just kidding. No. <laughs> uh, well, one, old age. I'm 51. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So, uh, it gets kind of hard to remember some things because, you know, you got so much going on around you, at least I do all the time, that it's hard to remember certain things. You know, you, you, can't, you have the hard drive's big and, and the, the seek rate's slow. So, <laughs> uh, plus, as I like to joke about at work, uh, I have so much being shoved in my brain every day with the work I do uh, that I like to jokingly call myself a leaky pressure vessel. The more you shove in, the more that leaks out. So, uh, and if I have time to think about things rather than just do it off the cuff, a lot of times I can remember stuff really well. Now, some things I can do off the cuff, some things I can't. Depends on how forward in my mind that thought or idea or memory is. If it's got to, if the brain's got to go and grind down it for a while and find it, then uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that it, it'll take a while before I remember it. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that in a few of my videos where I say, like, I can't remember the name of this, and then halfway through the video, the name pops up, and I can remember it just fine, just because the brain's had enough time to go look for it. Uh, so, anyways, that's that's that. I didn't want to drag on that too long, but that answers hopefully answers your question. Uh, second one. Uh, I wanted to recover this. I've covered it once, but I wanted to cover it again. Uh, AI art. Um, as I stated before, do not use it for production. Do not use it for your covers. Do not use it for your internal art. Do not use it for anything for which there's a royalty or a fee or a charge or anything like that. Uh, it's okay for personal use. You can use it for example art. Uh, like, you know, for example, uh, you know, I've got all these different ones. These are all AI art, They're, and they allow me to look at just different things and come up and say, okay, you know, she has this leather shoulder, and it's a, wo wo and a wo wo <laughs> woven woolen outfit with these little diamonds and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of roughing it out, but, you know, like she's got long hair and a serious look and everything. Uh, you got this, this river here. Uh... You got this guy. Sword's too short, but you know that sword should be big, like a claymore. Uh, and it's got the weird spikes on it and stuff. So, but you know, if you correct for that in your mind, you could, you could easily run with this. Uh, got a simple dining table. Like if you're having a meeting, you could describe the room and the table and everything using this image. Because these, you know, AI art in this sense is useful uh, because. You know, I mean, you can Google for it. You can go through stock art and stuff like that and get the same thing. Uh, the AI art, though, will allow you to get a lot closer to what you're after. You won't necessarily always hit it on the money. I've hit a couple on the money. Most of them, though, it's it's a case of close enough. And I can adjust for what little things are wrong with it as long as I have the base image to work with. Uh, like, you know, this one right here, I've got the uh, Angalorians. This one would be a perfect one for Angalorians. Maybe this is one of their priests or monks or something helps you describe what they might look like uh, and you don't have to follow the exact image that the AI gives you you know you can take certain highlights from it and say well he had this he had that he had a hood with uh, you know maybe his hood instead of having these squigglies uh, his outfit has moons all over it, or crescent moons or whatever you know you, you could adjust it you know be creative you're a writer just you know be creative with how you uh, with how you describe what your, uh, you know, what the picture is or what your actual item is. Because it, it, it's it's there to help you with your creativity. It's not there to replace it. It's there to help you with it. So it'll give you ideas and stuff to go on. Uh, like this is a good one if you're describing somebody entering a, a Sicilian type town. Uh, got some freaky alien with identity issues. <laughs> uh, bipedal pork, you know, it's just little things like that fun you know something that's a fun kids adventure you could have something like this for that uh something that's like for sci-fi you could have this as maybe an interface that they run into or some kind of portal or gateway fantasy village 
uh, sci-fi holographic interface, stuff like that. It's you know, it's it's a useful tool uh, for assisting your creativity because sometimes, and I've done this, is why I started doing example art is there are times I can picture it in my head, but I can't take what's in my head and put it on the paper. But if I find an image that's as close to what I have in my head as I can get, then it makes it easier translating from what's in my head to what's on the paper, and it's a lot easier. Uh, you know, and, and you don't, again, you don't have to do this. You could, you know, if you're an artist, you could draw your own. Uh, you know, it's, it just comes down to, you know, what helps you write what helps you describe what helps you do your descriptions and also anytime you're doing things like this uh don't info dump on the you know and i've mentioned this before but don't info dump on the reader you know you don't have to tell them every teeny tiny little detail in this thing tell them as much as they need to know and no more if it if it gets to the point where it's you know you're telling them useless data stop but if it's useful data to the story Keep telling until until it stops being useful data. So, anyways, um, charity work. Charity work's an interesting one for writers. Uh, basically, what it is is you can create a story. It does not have to be copyrighted. Uh, if you feel the need to copyright it, okay. Uh, but really, if it's if it's part of a compendium, uh, like a short story anthology. That's the, the, the copyright's the responsibility of the party you're giving the story to. Because uh, you're giving it to them free of charge as a charity offering. Meaning you're going to have no kickback, so you have, you, know, you have nothing into this except the story. You have no risk of loss because there's, no gonna, there's gonna be no money made on your part. All you're doing is you're giving them a story which they can then use to make money for their charity. It's like that Lightning Strikes Twice short story I showed you guys in the uh, in one of the other, or in a short series I did on uh, uh, writing, well, just writing short stories, I think is what it was. I can't remember anymore, but which goes back to point number one. But anyways, uh, yeah, when you give it to them, write something, write something nice, do your best. Do it like you're going to write a professional uh, Clive Cussler or Orson Scott Card or something, something that is going to sell a million copies reason you know reason being is yes you're not going to make any money out of it which you, you know which money should not be your first priority anyways like i've said before that should not be your first priority however you, when you write it you want to give them the best because when you're giving them you know when you're doing charity work don't you know don't halfway it you know um i don't want to say the other word and i'm sure you guys know what i'm talking about uh it's the counterpart word to donkey but anyways don't do it halfway. Give them your best quality work because they need to sell that book to make money to fund their charity. So, you know, like I say, it's it and it also that book that you give to them is a reflection on you. So even though you won't get any money out of the uh, out of giving them the story, people will see your name on that story in that collection or whatever it is. And that will reflect on you just the same as if you were, if you were producing a regular book for publishing by a, uh, uh, oh, God. I can think of, I can think of two of them, but they're not, they're not who I'm thinking of. Uh, Random House, that, that's one. Say like you're going to publish a Random House and you're looking at selling anywhere from 100,000 to a million copies. Are, are you going to give them a half-hearted, poorly done book? Or are you going to give them your absolute professional best? You would give them your best. You would go and do, you would work your butt off. You would throw everything into that to make that the best possible story. Because you're going to have a lot of eyeballs on it. Well, even if a charity charity book is only, you know, only sells 2,000 copies, that's still 2,000 eyeballs that you know of and possibly another 1,000 to 2,000 more that you don't know of because they handed that book off to somebody else to read. So you've got four to 5,000 possible eyeballs on that book, which, like I say, that's going to reflect on the charity that you're, you're helping out, and it's going to reflect on you. And that could hurt them, and it could hurt you if it's not good quality. So anyways. Uh, anyways. Uh, 
Number four here, math fun for number nerds. I know some of you are number nerds. You're math nerds. Uh, you love this kind of stuff. This right here, I'm not going to show it to you because YouTube gets their panties in a bunch. So I'll just give you the URL. Uh, but anyways, this this one's really cool. I, I looked at part of it, and there's a lot of heavy math in it. But if you're in big into math, this one's a fun one. And you could, you know, and what, how does it apply to writing? You know, it depends on if, uh, you know, it depends on what kind of book you're writing and if you have certain things that need specific, you know, specific numbers. Like when I did uh, Earthly, I think it was book two, uh, Destiny's Mission, I had to sit down and, like I've said before, I suck at math. So it this took me a while. But I had to sit down and figure out FTL speeds, how far, you know, how long it would take them to go X number of light years in a, in a you know, or how many light years could they go in an hour? What was the distance? And so on and so forth. So, you know, there will be times you have to figure that out to have canon accuracy. Uh, and so knowing how to do math and do, you know, even complex math is important. And, you know, like I said, but if you're just a, you're just a math nerd and you're not going to use this for your book, fine. It's it's still a fun video. I, th I kind of enjoyed it even though it went way over my head. Uh, okay, point five. This right here is neat. If you're doing anything that's a fantasy book, uh, survival, colonialism, uh, historical, anything like that, this right here is neat because it talks about how people did stuff back in 1919. Uh, 1919 was kind of a crossover era or period because uh, when we got out of, let's see, if you look at like America, pre-Civil War or pre-1850, Pre-1850 was a lot like it was in 1776. Very rustic, very rural, very basic. Once you got past 1850, now you started more into modernity. Uh, once they got to the other side of the... Uh, once you got to the other side of the Civil War, and I think it was uh, either National Geographic or History Channel, one of the two of them, had an interesting series on the giants, the industrial giants of America. And they talk about, uh, well, it wasn't just the, it wasn't just the industrial, it was the economic giants. Because you have J.P. Morgan, you have uh, Rockefeller, Ford, uh, there's two other ones. One guy did, uh, one guy who founded Standard Oil, I think that was Rockefeller, um, it was one other guy that preceded him, and I can't remember him. He was a big train tycoon. But anyways, if you watch it, they have like five or six of these guys, and it's really interesting because uh, they helped. They not only were coming in on the front end of modernity because they started doing oil wells, uh, figuring out how to drill oil wells and stuff, which part of why Rockefeller became a big oil giant. Uh, then you had, you know, like the banking system, and you had... Uh, Carnegie, that was one of them. Carnegie, he did uh, he did a lot of interesting architecture, but he was also a uh, steel magnet. So, and not magnet as in like a magnet like on your fridge. I'm talking magnet as in like a uh, monopolist, somebody who was huge into this. Uh, Carnegie was a big one. Uh, they cover Tesla and Westinghouse. Uh, there's one other one, and it was he was the first one of the group. First one oldest, but anyways, it's a really interesting show uh, that's, that would add to this. And it's a four-part series. It's up on YouTube. You can find it. I'm not going to link it, mostly because I didn't think to link it beforehand, and I'm not going to go over there and try to find it while we're doing the video. So uh, anyways, this one here, along with that uh, Giants of America, I, that's not the exact name of it, but I think you could probably find it. Uh, like I say, it was either History Channel or National Geographic, and they talked about the post eighteen or the post Civil War period where we were transitioning into modernity, which comes back to this with nineteen nineteen because in nineteen nineteen you've still got things left over from the pre Civil War era, but then you've also got elements of modernity, so it's an interesting and you know it's an interesting one to study. Uh, like I say, it's good for fantasy, it's good for historical. Uh, Survival fiction, maybe uh, uh, colonization. Because, like, if you, even on a sci-fi, you land people on a planet, you're not, you know, when you, those guys hit the dirt, there's not going to be any infrastructure. 
you know they're going to be going back to 1850s 1820s 18 you know early 1800 uh, style living because they're going to have to take they're going to take time to build up the uh, the infrastructure I've even seen that in video games where uh, what was it they had uh, it was an old Microsoft game uh, you flew around basically as a merchant or a mercenary or whatever and you jumped between these uh, these different portals to get to these different planets and they show that when people left Earth and came to there, they landed, they had their little ship, it touched down, they kind of set up camp, and they slowly disassembled the ship and used that to build other things, and then they used that as the foundation to build more, and they were able to eventually go from uh, from like colonial era living with modern era perks, some perks, not a lot, but they had some perks. Uh, they also had modern era knowledge. So they had the knowledge, they had some of the tech. Mostly it was living 1800s and it was trying to build up new technology, build up new infrastructure, all that stuff so they could expand and grow and survive. Uh, anyways, that's one that you could uh, go with. Uh, this one right here, uh, this one do this one doesn't go into quite as much detail as this one, but it does cover some things that isn't covered here. And it gives you the, you know, the whereas this is post Civil War or, the, or this one's post Civil War, this one's pre Civil War, and it shows what America was like coming out of 1776, the colonial period, period, the Revolutionary War, stuff like that. But it's not up to the 1850s, 1860s, because you got to remember in 1850s and 60s we had steam trains, early steam trains, but we had steam trains. Uh, in 1800, they didn't. They had horse and buggy, and cattle, and that was pretty much it. And you, were, you know, you run around in wagons and horseback, and you know, you had the big open hearths and all that stuff. So really, really interesting to to study. Uh, last point, uh, point seven, uh, ways to use your writing superworld. Uh, if you've watched my video about a writing superworld, you'll know what the, know what that is. If you haven't, go back and watch that first, and then watch the or then watch the rest of this. Uh, but anyways, something that came up. Somebody was asking, okay, that's great that you have your writing superworld. How do you use it? Well, really, any way you want to. Uh, the thing with writing superworlds is it's kind of a grab bag of stuff. It's, you know, stuff that you've role-played, stuff that you've thought of, you know, just like I explained in the video. It's all the ideas that you have wrapped up in one gigantic package. And as an example, you could take, like, let's just say you have a pirate adventure. But, you know, if you start out with the base image and it's a pirate and he's on a galleon, he's got a sword and they've got cannons and muskets and stuff like that. Okay. Why not? Well, you dip, You want to add a little bit of a sci-fi twist to it. I mean, Disney's done this, and some other people have done this. Uh, Pirate Island, the one that Disney did, movie sucked, but it, if you, it's good for ideas if you want to look at it for how to how to kind of do Darwin or not Darwin's grab bag, but uh, well, Darwin's grab bag too, yeah. But how to do like a grab bag out of your stuff? Uh, I think it was. I think it was another one. Earth A E. That's another good one. Uh, just, you know, as far as ways to, uh, as far as ways to grab ideas out of your super world and mix them up and stuff. But anyways, going back to the pirate idea, let's just say you want to change it up a little bit, make it a bit more sci-fi. Okay. You could leave the outfit the same if you want to, or you could change the outfit around, uh, maybe even the hat a little bit, uh, instead of like a saber, he, or instead of like a metal saber or, uh. I'm trying to think what some of those were. The different cut, cutlass, that's what I'm thinking of. You could have a saber or a cutlass or something like that. Instead of having that, uh, why not have a, a lightsaber? And I mean, you can't use lightsaber specifically because Disney will sue you into six, you know, six billion years into the future. Uh, but you could call it a laser sword. You could call it a plasma sword, plasma saber. There's other people that have done that, and that's that's out in public domain. That's something you're free to use. Uh, and instead of a muzzle-loading musket, you might have a blaster. Uh, he might have a jet pack so he can fly around. 
Uh, instead of a regular parrot, he's got a robotic parrot, uh, or he might have an android sidekick, like, you know, kind of like an R2-D2, or not R2-D2, excuse me, C-3PO running around with him. Somebody like that. Uh, you know, or some big some big bot like uh, Lost in Space. Or no, Danger Will Robinson. You know, and his pirate ship, maybe his pirate ship's still a galleon, but it has the ability to fly through the air. Instead of sails, it has a great big blimp on it, or it has impulse drives, or something like that. You know, take it, pull out of, you know, and maybe you have other stuff that's better than that in your writing world, your super world. Go in there, pull ideas out, mix and match, find something that you think is fun. Uh, put them together and run with it. You know, if it if it feels like it's clunky or it's dumb or something, don't do it. You know. Uh, but if it's something that makes the story fun, makes the character fun, yeah, do it. You know, mix it, match it, make them unique. So, uh, and as a bonus item for this video, um, my question to you guys now is, what do you want to talk about next? Because uh, I'm kind of out of ideas at this point. I've, I've told you basically everything I can think of at the moment. I might come up with some stuff along the way later on, but at this point in time, I'm out of ideas. So if you have something you want me to talk about, uh, things you want me to elaborate on, expound on, etc., etc., please let me know. I'm, I'm definitely game to uh, talk about other things. And like I say, the... The offer to do a writer's group, uh, to do like a Discord chat where we get together once a week, once a month, whatever, whatever time frame works for everybody, and just sit there and talk about writing. Maybe bounce ideas off of each other, uh, uh, critique stuff, etc., etc. Yeah, I, you know, that's still on the table if you guys want to do it. I haven't had anybody take me up on it, but if you're interested, uh, I'm still willing to do it. So... Anyhow, I'll leave it at that, and I'll catch you guys in the next video if I have anything more to give you. But <laughs> if I do, you'll see me in the next video. See ya.